pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space and ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us to bind us to our Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and work of ours may begin with you and through you be happily completed through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One adjustment. And uh, there we go. So it's good to be with you all tonight. And sorry about last week. If anybody came, a couple of people came. And uh, but um, so many people were sick and I was feeling under the weather. So um, so today will be the last class and then we'll have Christmas and after Christmas. And I have to make a schedule for what I'm going to do starting in January. Um, but my plan is to keep going, uh, whether it's online or in person. And um, I just have to make a schedule after getting through Christmas. There's, there's a lot to surrender and let our Lord do. And sometimes I forget that our Lord's in charge of everything. And um, whenever we do that, we're in trouble. So um, so we're going to pick up where we left off and we've been talking about concupiscence and how concupiscence affects love. And so we started talking about, <clears throat> by talking about the original experiences and the way that love was in the beginning, and then how sin distorts love. Today, we're going to finish up on that and then start looking forward to redeemed love. And so I think this was the last slide that I covered last class um, which was referring to the radical change in original nakedness. Remember, original nakedness is our ability to be transparent, right? Our, our freedom to share who we are with others. And, and because of sin, shame enters into the world, and then shame always leads us to hide who we are. And, and there's lots of ways that we do that. You know, like there's lots of ways people hide who they are. Some people hide who they are by acting like they're better than they are. Some people hide who they are by just not taking care of themselves very well. Some people hide who they are, like they want to keep people away from them. I might have made reference to this before. Like I have a friend who has a lot of tattoos and somebody asked him if he got all those tattoos so that he would get attention. And he said, no, I got all these tattoos so people would leave me alone. So they would stay away from me. Right? I think sometimes like I smoke in order to like get away from people sometimes. It's like introvert time. and. Uh, and so, so it's like a double-edged sword though, because when you're a smoker, like everybody else who's a smoker just thinks they're supposed to come and talk to you about everything. And so you meet lots of great people. Um, but sometimes, you know, like we need some space to get away. Um, but there's also like ways that we hide. And the body was from the beginning marked, so to speak, as the visible factor of transcendence, the, in virtue of which man as a person surpasses the visible world of living beings. In this sense, the human body was from the beginning a faithful witness and perceptible verification of man's original solitude in the world. So the body itself gave witness to the fact that we're created to be in relationship with the Lord. Also through masculinity and femininity, a transparent component of reciprocal giving in the communion of persons and, and our masculinity and our femininity reveals the fact that we're created to be in relationship with each other, right? So our body in and of itself reveals that we're made to be in relationship with God. Our masculinity and our femininity reveal the fact that we're supposed to and created to be in relationship with one another. But now because of sin, man in some way loses the original certainty of the image of God expressed in his body. Right? And because of original sin, we start to think that I'm not very good, right? as opposed to the first blessing, which says, and it was very good because of sin and shame, we start to say, oh, there's something wrong with me, or there's something defective about me. And we start to doubt that original blessing, which is an expression of the doubt of the image of God that's lived out and experienced in our daily lives. He also loses his acceptance of the visible world. And, and so there's actually a rupture between man and the world. The Lord says to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. And when he says, I was afraid, it also expresses the awareness of being defenseless 
and in a sense, and a sense of insecurity about his bodily structure in the face of the processes of nature that operate with an inevitable determinism. And so that fear that enters into the world, it, it also can be a fear of the world, you know, like fear of floods or earthquakes or things like that. I remember in like little kid CCD when I was in little kid CCD. And, um, and I think one of the ways that, that things were taught was, you know, if there was an original sin, there wouldn't be tornadoes or there wouldn't be hurricanes and there wouldn't be floods and there wouldn't be like all of the kind of things the natural world does that makes life difficult wouldn't have been there because everything would have been in balance. So John Paul II uses this term cosmic shame to talk about the rupture that's experienced between us and the world. And then this other term, imminent shame, is shame manifested in our interiority, right? So, so it's the way I feel about myself. The imminent shame is like, I feel like I'm a defective person. I feel like something's wrong with me. I believe that something's wrong with me. You know, one question that people ask a lot is, what's the difference between guilt and shame? Like, what's the difference between guilt and shame? You know, like guilt is a natural feeling we have when we do something wrong. That is a signal that we need to repair relationship. Um, shame is this sense that I am something wrong, right? So shame is more of an identity. It has more of an identity rootedness. Whereas guilt is like, yeah, I violated this rule or I hurt somebody in some way and I need to apologize. I need to repair. Shame is like, I'm a completely defective person and I just want to go hide or disappear or not be known. Relative shame is shame in the face of another person, right? Relative shame is when we're sort of afraid to be around other people or we're afraid that people will come to know about us. When, when I'm working with people who have addictions, like one of the core beliefs of everybody with an addiction is that if people really knew me, they would reject me, right? If somebody knew everything about my life, they wouldn't want anything to do with me. And, and that's this expression of relative shame. It's shame in the face of another person. There's a specific difficulty in sensing the human essentiality of one's own body. So, so there's, there can be this alienation of our body, or we think our bodies don't matter, or our bodies are just kind of, I don't know, we're like renters, and we just kind of like live in our body, and our body serves to make us feel good sometimes. There's a fracture in his interior, or rupture of original spiritual bodily and bodily unity. So we do believe that original sin leads to this fracture, this rupture, of the original spiritual and bodily unity. So whenever we feel like there's a rupture or a distance or, or like my, my body and my spirit aren't, in, aren't congruent or I don't belong in my own body, like all of that we've always believed is a result of original sin. And all of us in some way, shape or form have experienced that in our lifetime. Right? Like most people who have ever gone through puberty experience the fact that I don't really feel like I fit in my body right now, right? Unless you rocked puberty, like did everybody rock puberty? Um, like, this is one of my favorite questions to ask clergy. I'm like, who rocked puberty? Because um, everybody feels awkward at that time in their life, right? And I'm saying that to normalize because, um, because the fact that teenagers, they don't really feel right. Like that's part of, sometimes it's just part of being a teenager, right? Sometimes there's clinical gender dysphoria for sure. Sometimes people have trauma. Sometimes people have, there's lots of things, but, but at some level, we all experience that in some way. <clears throat> Their body is no longer subject to the spirit, but it carries within it a constant hotbed of resistance against the spirit and threatens in some way man's unity as a person, right? So our body is meant to be subject to the spirit, right? Like, like that kind of idea of our flesh and our spirit being at war. When things are in balance, like before the fall, then I always do what I want to do. But St. Paul says, I do the things I don't want to do. 
and and I don't do the things that I want to do. And, and in some sense, sometimes like my body experiences cravings and then I like, there's a big bunch of Sam's club cookies on the shelf back there. And I had one and I had three. Um, cause, and, and like my body just kind of was experiencing that. Um, and those are like concrete ways that we experience that reality. So when talking about shame, there is something of a sexual character to shame. And, and sometimes shame is almost always and exclusively associated with sexuality. Um, there's a video that I show a lot of times when I do trainings. And it's this still face experiment that Dr. Ed Tronic did. And so the still face experiment was um, they had a bunch of infants and they would ask their mother to not respond to them. And so you, you see a mother and a baby and they're kind of like, they're in this sort of dyadic relationship and you know, the, the baby points and the mom looks and, and the mom makes kind of a noise and the baby makes a noise back and the mom smiles and the baby smiles. And, and you know, like lots of us have experienced that with, with babies, you know, like there's, there's a couple that comes to RCI on Monday and they have a new baby. And then there's a teenager that comes to RCI on Monday and she spends the whole time trying to make the baby smile, which is kind of cute actually watching it all happen. Um, but, th but that's how babies are. And then they ask the mom to not respond to the baby. And so no matter what the baby does, the mom's just like, and you see the baby like kind of smile. Mom doesn't smile. The baby points, mom doesn't point. The baby kind of like starts to make a screeching sound mom does nothing. And eventually the baby kind of loses control of their body. They start like freaking out and they turn and cover their face. And, <clears throat> and then I said, I, I ask people, so, so what did you notice there? And, and they'll say, well, I noticed frustration and I noticed anger and, and I kind of noticed joy, like when they were reconnecting, because then they let the mom reinteract and repair the relationship. And then I was, and then I asked the question, like, what about shame? Because shame is usually expressed by covering our face. And somebody once said to me, well, there's no way the baby could have shame. How could the baby have shame? Because again, like sometimes we think shame is only about having a sexual character, but shame is the result of, shame can be the result of not being seen or not being known or feeling like we don't matter or feeling invisible. I got friends and, uh, or I've had this experience a couple different times where like I was talking to a brother priest and I was just sharing kind of the difficulties of whatever I was going through, probably like personal life, the burden I was carrying pastorally or whatever. And, and they're just looking at me like, mm. no expression, no like, wow, that's really hard. And, and I just felt like I started to feel like there must be something wrong with me because I think these things are a big deal and that person's not reacting, right? Like, I think that might be a common experience that other people ex have sometimes. Um, and, and that's really an experience of shame. Like when we have that, like, I don't feel connected. And, <clears throat> but the sphere of sexuality does bring to light the imbalance springing from concupiscence, and especially from the concupiscence of the body. And so one of the principles that Jean Paul II talks about a lot when he's talking about sexuality is that the body expresses the person and that the sexual embrace between a man and a woman, it expresses the fullness of the communion of persons, but also, the imbalance of concupiscence, oftentimes it shows up first in the area of sexuality. You know, like people who struggle with compulsive sexual behaviors of any kind, like it's, it's just like the first place that that imbalance might show up. And, and, and there's nothing to be like alarmist about. It's just, if those things are showing up in people's lives, um, it just means like, oh, wait, I have to look at my heart a little bit and kind of figure out what's going on there. You know, and, and if we could be curious about those things that signal an imbalance, well, then, then we have a chance at healing and integration. 
<clears throat> so man ceases to be above the world of living beings. <clears throat> And the heart holds both desire and shame. So the heart, by closing itself to what comes from the Father, opens itself to what comes from the world. And, and I think that's a great quote, right? When we close ourselves to what comes from the Father, we open ourselves to what comes from the world. When we stop receiving love from God, we start looking for love in the world. And Or when, like, the, the way I express it is, like, I forget that the Lord's enough for me. You know, I forget that the Lord's enough for me. And, and I've talked about this in a homily. I probably said it last class, you know, like I had a little rough interaction over Thanksgiving and I didn't really pay attention to it. And I came home and I ordered a, and I ate like half a pizza. And, and I would say, I forgot that the Lord is enough for me. And in closing myself to what comes from the father, I opened myself to what comes from Casey's. All right. And just very simply, that's what I did. And, uh, and it wasn't like I willfully closed myself to the father. I didn't say like, Oh God doesn't, he's not there for me. It was just, I kind of forgot because I got caught off guard. Um, I need to plug in my computer right now. So shame can have two meanings. Um, the first is that it's a threat to the value. Um, and the second is that it preserves the value. And so sometimes John Paul II will be quoted as saying that there's a positive shame and a negative shame. And, and so he's saying like negative shame is a threat to the value. Like negative shame reveals the fact that somebody has violated us in some way. And even if that violation is simply like somebody's ignored me, right? Or somebody hasn't respond to, responded to me. Somebody hasn't been there for me. Okay. It's a threat to value. When we say that shame preserves the value, what he's really talking about is modesty and, and, and just that kind of carefulness that we have about what we reveal to who. And, and so if shame makes us hide or shame makes us cover ourselves, then we're really talking about modesty. So I'm going to cover myself or hide simply to preserve the value so that I can trust and make sure that I can trust who I'm in relationship with. And that happens emotionally too, right? Like we, we have to be careful. Right? We want to be careful about like, who do I share my heart with, right? Who do I share my heart with? And <clears throat> sometimes like when I give talks, I, I talk about, the struggles that I've had in my life. And I talk about my family and, and I do things like that. And, and sometimes we share in order to like invite relationship. Um, there are other, there are other places in my heart though, that, you know, like I share with a few people, there's a few people who get that part and, and who know that part of me. And, um, and that was something I had to grow into a lot in my own healing process, you know, because, like when we're preserving the value, um, we want to be able to, to reveal ourselves to somebody that we're, I said it this way, in a way that, we, that shows that we care about the fact that they care about us, if I can say it that way. So, so like in my relationship with my therapist, super interesting, you know, because I'll go in and I'll tell her everything about my life. I'll tell her everything but I don't really care whether or not she receives it well. And one day she's like, do you think, do you believe I care about you? And I go, I'm paying you a hundred bucks to care about me. <laughs> you have, you kind of care about me because you have to. And, uh, and then I don't know. I, I don't know what happened. There was a few times where I had like a really bad week and she was like, why didn't you call me? You can call me when you have a bad week. You can call me when we don't have appointments. I'm like, wait, what? Uh, I, can't, I don't want to be a burden. And then I think like there was a couple of times where I actually did call her when we didn't have appointments. And then like, I think I started to care about the fact that she cared about me. Right. And, and it started to matter more that she received it, that she received it well. And, um, and there was a, a different, a different dynamism entered into our relationship in that way. 
In original sin, again, original communion is overturned. The body ceases to be free from suspicion. So then the body becomes suspicious. As if the original function were called into doubt. And sexual complementarity is now seen as mutual opposition. So instead of like a suitable helpmate, this is somebody who's against me. Or this is somebody who's a threat to me. Or this is somebody who can use me. That shame invading the man-woman relation as a whole was manifested through the imbalance of the original meaning of bodily unity. That is, through the imbalance of the body as a specific substratum of the communion of persons. <clears throat> so, so that shame that invades the man-woman relation, the opposition between men and women, um, was manifested through the imbalance of the original meaning of bodily unity. Right? And, and so that reciprocity in relationship kind of that I draw on the board as like desiring the good for the other and that person entrusting their heart. Right. And that happens in both ways. Now is out of balance. And so instead of wanting the good, like I don't necessarily want, they're going to want my good. And, and instead of giving ourselves, we end up grasping at or taking from another. Then this might be a double slide. I don't know. But we can also have shame about our own body. And, um, and this is just a line, again, I think in a world where we have so much gender bending ideology. Um, John Paul II, again, wrote this in the early 80s difficulty in identifying oneself with one's own body, not only in the sphere of one's own subjectivity, but even more so in regard to the subjectivity of the other human being, a woman for man and man for women. So we have a difficulty identifying somebody with their own body or identifying ourselves with our own body. And, and again, I think that happens in lots of ways. Like whenever we're dissociating, we're not identifying with our body or we're not grounded or we're not living in our body right now. You know, like sometimes when I'm on a Netflix binge and time's going by, like, you know, I don't really notice, right? Or when we eat a lot of food, we don't really notice. Um, so again, that way that shame enters into the relationship between men and women, your desire will be for your husband, but he will dominate you. Isn't only about conjugal life, but it refers to the whole context of their relationship. And, and there's this other line he uses and says, they're no longer male and female, but they're male or female. And, and their union is threatened by the insatiability of that union and unity. So remember that the first place love is ruptured is the relationship between us and God. And, and it's the Lord who is the first person that can meet all our needs. And so when we're cut off from God or we're not open to the grace that God wants to give us, then we always sort of are acting out of our needs. So we start to look to the world instead of to God or to Casey's or whatever. Well, then somebody can start to look to their spouse to fill the need that was meant to be filled by God. And that's what makes it insatiable, right? It can never be satisfied. A human being can never satisfy what only God can satisfy. Because God is God and he's infinite and the human being is finite, right? And it happens a lot. One of the biggest kind of, um, I don't know, dynamics that, that is troublesome for couples is when one spouse wants the other spouse to be their God, essentially. Like they wouldn't say, I want you to be my God, but they would blame all of their problems on that person, right? Like you're the source of all my problems. And instead of like going to God with that complaint or instead of looking to God to fix it, I'm looking to this person to fix it. <clears throat> so again, shame, which according to biblical narrative makes the man and woman hide their own bodies before each other and especially their sexual differentiation confirms that the original power of communicating themselves to each other about which Genesis 2.25 speaks has been shattered. Okay, so shame confirms that the original unity has been shattered. Whenever we want to hide from another person, it's confirming that original unity has been shattered. 
Reciprocal communion in humanity itself through the body and through its masculinity and femininity is overturned. As if the bodily body in its masculinity and femininity ceased to be free from suspicion as the substratum of the communion of persons, as if its original function were called into doubt. Okay. I think these are double, sorry. And so, so I'm going to transition over to, okay, how does that get healed? Or like, like, what does it look like to be redeemed? Or is redemption possible? You know, and so we've covered sort of the way things were supposed to be, what it looks like when it's distorted, you know, which and there's a lot about shame in that because like shame is the biggest indicator that love has been distorted. And, and so the next section John Paul II goes into is, is what it means to live redeemed and what does redeemed life look like? <clears throat> and that redemption takes place <clears throat> through mercy. And so this is from Divis and Misericordia 13, which is the second encyclical letter John Paul II wrote on mercy. And he says this, therefore the church professes and proclaims conversion and conversion to God always consists in discovering his mercy. That is, in discovering that love which is patient and kind is only the creator and father can be. The love to which the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ is faithful to the uttermost consequences in the history of his covenant with man, even to the cross and death and resurrection of the son. Conversion to God is always the fruit of the rediscovery of his father who is rich in mercy. And, and so... Everything's going, to, everything gets repaired also according to that anthropological pattern. And it gets repaired through mercy. <clears throat> it gets repaired when love like breaks through our shame and, and allows us to be vulnerable again. <clears throat> In that same document, John Paul II says, authentic knowledge of the God of mercy, the God of tender love is a constant and inexhaustible source of conversion not only as a momentary interior act, but also as a permanent attitude, as a state of mind. Those who come to know God in this way, who see him in this way, can live only in a state of being continually converted to him. They live therefore in statu conversionis, and it is this state of conversion which marks out the most profound element of the pilgrimage of every man and woman on earth in statu viatoris. And so, so he's saying that when we, when we really receive mercy, we can't help but be continually converted to him. And it becomes a source of conversion, not just as a momentary interior act, but we're constantly being converted. We're constantly falling in love with him. And, th and so there's this constant sort of growth that's going on in our hearts, right? That's more important than, you know, the, the statue via Taurus is like the way of pilgrimage, like I'm walking towards the Lord. The statue conversionis, the state of conversion, is like I'm constantly falling in love with him. And, and again, like it's mercy that leads to conversion. And, and, it, and I think that's such an important point because, um, because sometimes we can fall into the temptation to think that like academic arguments lead to conversion or apologetics leads to conversion. Um, sometimes like evangelicals who become Catholic, they think apologetics lead to conversion because like it was apologetics that helped them to realize the Catholic church was right. And their church was not, not right, but they were already converted in their hearts. Like their hearts already knew the Lord for the most part, like we, who are Catholics our whole life, a lot of people are Catholic their whole life and they know what the church teaches, but they haven't like, <laughs> they haven't fallen in love with the Lord yet, or, or they don't know the Lord yet, or they don't know that the Lord knows them. And, and when they come to know that, like, that's when, that's when the really good stuff happens. And so, and in redemption is kind of going back to these diagrams, <laughs> this moment in which Christ gives his life on the cross for the church. And, and the cross is the proof that God wants the good for them. So if original sin started when doubt was cast on the gift, 
right? Like I doubt the fact that God wants the good for me. Then redemption happens when we see the cross as a manifestation of the gift. That when we look at a crucifix, what we see is the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Or when we look at the cross, what we see is that at my worst moment, our Lord died for me. Like at my worst moment, he looked at me and he loved me and he gave his life so I could live. And, and when we come to see the cross in that way, well, if that's true, if, if that's really true, then, okay, he's trustworthy. I can give my heart to him. And I can open myself back up to the Father as the source of everything. I can remember the fact that God's enough for me. And I don't need to open myself to the world because I'm opening myself to the Lord. And that way of living is what John Paul II calls the ethos of redemption, right? The ethos of redemption. And so I put this line on there to move from turning away to experiencing his genuine love. There's this story, Christopher West loves to tell it. um, And it's this story of like two bishops and one of them, then a prostitute walks by and one of them looks away and the other one looks at her. And the one who looks away says, what are you doing? You need to look away. And, and he, but the one who was looking at her, like was looking at her with mercy and was looking at her with love. So one is afraid of her because she's an occasion of sin. The other one is looking towards her because he can love her in a genuine way as a father. And and that dynamic is something that can be pointed to like in our own lives. That the ethos of redemption means that I'm always living from that perspective of love, right? I'm always living from that perspective of love. And so I don't need to be afraid of the world around me. So sometimes when, when I'm walking with people who are struggling with chastity and, uh, and I might say, okay, so what are you trying to do to stop? Well, like I'm, do, I'm using these filters and I'm not watching television and I'm doing this and I'm trying to like do it and I'm locking myself in my room and like, like I'm putting up all these boundaries so I don't have a fall, right? Or like I might be on a diet. And so I like put up all these boundaries and I'm not going to like do anything. I'm going to make somebody come over and actually like drop food off and I'm no food in my house. Well, if my heart doesn't change, as soon as I'm in front of food, I'm just going to like go crazy. And, and it's not the world that's the problem. It's my heart that's the problem. Jesus says, right? It's not what you put in the body that poisons it, but what comes out from his heart. And so the ethos of redemption is about a change of heart. And, and this movement from a kind of like negative eros to a positive ethos and a positive way of living. So eros isn't always a sort of bad thing. Erratic phenomena are those mutual actions and ways of behaving through which a man and woman approach each other and unite so as to be one flesh. Like that's what we typically would call erotic phenomena. Eros can be experienced as lust, but eros also can be experienced in the original unity of man and woman. Right? Eros can just be about how we fall in love with each other. Right? And there's something good about falling in love with each other. You know, my teacher, Jose Noriega, he would talk about four phenomenological dimensions of love. And the first of those is carnal or bodily love, right? And it's part of falling in love. Part of falling in love is being physically attracted to another person. And, and then the second is emotional, the, the emotional dimension. And the emotional dimension is about how I feel when I'm around this person. Like this person makes me feel good. I get excited to see them. I'm happy when they're happy. I kind of sad when they're sad. And, and then there's the personal dimension, which is when I love that person for who they are, which is, might be different from the way I fantasized about them being. Right? Sometimes when people are falling in love, they have like idealism and, and they have all these good feelings. And then, and then they get married and they're like, you leave your underwear everywhere. And, and like, there's like, you find out they have warts or like whatever it is. And then, but you love them anyways, right? But you love them anyways. And then the religious dimension of love is when I recognize God gave me this person, right? And all four of those are part of love, 
all four of those are integrated in the beginning. So so many experiences, all of them. And, and we sometimes we say these things that drive me crazy, like love is a choice and not a feeling. But like love is a feeling. And if there's not a feeling, like it's worth exploring, like, okay, what's, what's missing? And because like, I mean, if I ask like a couple who's married like 60 years, like what kept you together? Choice. Like that's beautiful. Um, <laughs> and uh, like, we have to make a choice every single day, but then there's also like these other dimensions and one's not supposed to be separate from the others. All right, so Eros does apply, right? To the original unity of and woman. And when Eros and Ethos meet in the human heart, they bear fruit and purity. So purity is when like I live out relationality Right, with that proper disposition of my heart. <clears throat> so what is erotic and what is ethical don't differ from what from each other. They're called the meat and the human heart. Which means Eros has to be redeemed, transformed, and sanctified, but never snuffed out. And through purification, the erotic becomes true, good, and beautiful. This is taken from the Song of Songs. Like a guardian who watches over a hidden spring, we're called to discern the deep impulses of our hearts. Right? Like a guardian who watches over a hidden spring, we're called to discern the deep impulses of our hearts. And, and our, the goal is to draw forth what is fitting for the dignity of the gift and the communion of persons. And, and that means that we, like, we have to be curious about what's going on in our hearts. And and curious about the people around us and, and have a desire to, right, to approach every single person, you know, in that perspective of knowing their dignity and seeking their dignity and, and desiring the good for them. And, and whatever relationship that we have, you know, like as a priest, there's a lot of kind of discerning of my own heart when it comes to like relationships in my life, whether it's with parishioners or with the big spiritual directors or, or other people and, and kind of like, and I try to have like a genuine curiosity for like, like people and, and, and what's, what makes them tick and, and what's going on in their life, you know, without being like a weirdo who's like, I need you to make an appointment and tell me everything that's going on. Um, but, but I try to do that because it also keeps us from getting, you know, overly frustrated with others. Like imagine if in your families, if you just did that, if you're just like somebody's like being a jerk and you're just like, hi, I wonder what's going on in their heart today. And then just trying to understand. And we have to understand the deep impulses of our own hearts too, which, which can also be like, why am I getting so offended by this right now? Or it might be, oh, I think I'm really attracted to that person. Or like just what like whatever it is that's going on there and when we don't pay attention to what's going on in our heart we usually get off track right we usually get off track so again when i'm working with people in addiction recovery like learning to do this is a huge part of addiction recovery right it's it's like learning to discern okay like what is that that's going on in my heart kind of like after i ate the pizza i had to go oh i know why i'm feeling kind of sad about this thing and i need to do something about that Otherwise, I'm going to keep eating pizza. Um, and so that ethos, right, that ethos of the gift, it doesn't stifle eros, but it affords a mature spontaneity and noble gratification. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, he who looks at a woman with lust is already committed adultery with her in his heart. And, and that's spoken in the perspective of the redemption of the body the perspective of the whole gospel, the whole teaching, the whole mission of Christ. And so, so really what's implied here is it's possible to not, right? Like if he's saying, looking at a woman with lust is like committing adultery in your heart, what's implied is it's possible to not look with lust. Like it's possible to be free because if our Lord, our Lord wouldn't ask us to do something that's impossible. And, and sometimes we lose sight of, of the possibility and the freedom that he desires. And so Christ's words don't condemn, they liberate us. Mary Healy has a book called Men and Women Are From Eden. And she uses the example of like, if there was a quadriplegic and Jesus came up to them and said, walk, 
<clears throat> Here we go. Jesus says to the cripple, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand. And so when our Lord says to us, when he calls us to purity, he'll enable us to be pure. Like how he does that, there's lots of ways that he does that. And, and there's like programs and things like this. And my own experience is that sometimes it takes a lot of tools to learn how to open my heart to the gift that he desires to give me. Because when we struggle to let people love us, it's a hard habit to break. Right? It's hard habit to break. Self-reliance is the hard habit to break. And learning to be sons and daughters is something that it happens over time and it happens in relationships of trust and it, and it happens in consistency. And, and the consistency of noticing the ways that our Lord shows up in, in our lives. And so sometimes, I mean, that might be why, like every time I preach, I'm preaching about that in some way, shape or form. Father John Ricardo, I was talking to him one day and he, uh, he was making a comment that basically all of his homilies are just like, Jesus loves you. And he said, this lady was walking out of church and she was like, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Why do you, what, when are you going to tell us something else, father? And he goes, um, I'll stop saying it when you start believing it. <laughs> and, and, and because obviously, okay, we don't have to like step one down yet. And, uh, and, and so again, like learning to breaking the habit of self-reliance is a, it's a hard habit to break. And, and grace is, right? Grace is the relationship between Christ and his church. So, so if we use, the, again, this model, these are like my old, old, old slides, but um, like Christ gives his life on the cross, all grace flows from the cross and the church then in receptivity to his grace. And it's like grace that is the bond between us and the Lord, right? Grace is that gift that's given to him. When we talk about grace, we're talking about the Holy Spirit being active. Right? The Holy Spirit does bind us to our Lord. And just as the Holy Spirit is the love between the father and the son, the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between the son and each and every one of us. The Beatitude says, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. And um, the purity of the body is making visible God's mystery. So to attain purity of heart, to see God, we must contend with the system of forces within us. <clears throat> so again, like what God wills, God enables. And so when he says, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God, he means it. And, and that it's actually possible. And living purity of heart means that that we see the body as making visible God's mystery, that, that when I see another person, I can see them as a daughter of the same father, right? Or a son of the same father as a person with their own unique story, a person that God loves in a unique, exclusive and unrepeatable way. And, um, and every person is a mystery in that way. And, and relationships are actually a lot more exciting in that way. <clears throat> But to, to attain purity of heart, we have to contend with the system of forces within us. St. Paul talks about that flesh-spirit battle. The flesh refers to the man of lust. And so, um, so I, I used to phrase it this way. We have to authentically move from the red to the blue or like on my other slides where I show like sort of that resistance to grace as a kind of that red line that blocks our, our grasping behaviors. And, and we have to get back to that place of being able to make a complete gift of ourselves to another. And in talking about purity, um, Mary Healy also has this line where she says, purity is not the halfway point between promiscuity and prudishness. That, that purity is something more than, right? Purity is about being in relationship with the Lord. It's not like finding the virtue between like being a heathen and being like a prude. It's, it's being in relationship with the Lord, right? So like purity is not attained by avoiding temptation. It's attained by being in relationship with the Lord. And, and again, that, I think it's a really important point because sometimes um, we were raised with this idea or we've heard tons of chastity talks where they basically say like, you have to avoid all these things and you have to be modest and you have to do this and you have to do this. 
um, or else something bad's going to happen, um, which puts a lot of pressure on us and makes it kind of all about us. But, but really like purity comes from being in relationship with God. And if we're in relationship with our Lord, like everything else has the flow from that, right? Everything else has the flow from that. There's too many dynamisms of, and it's, and it goes back to that kind of original sin point, you know, where I was giving a talk at Steubenville once and one of the professors, I think asked the question and he was making it sound as if the reason so many guys struggle with purity is because the way the girls dress. And I was just like, that's ridiculous. Like it's, that's, that's not the cause. Like, yes, they should like have respect for themselves and they need to be in relationship with our Lord. And they're probably hiding by revealing because we can do that too. But our purity is like about relationship with the Lord, right? Like there's a famous story of Thomas Aquinas whose parents locked him in a room with a hooker trying to get him to break his vow of chastity. And he just kept like avoiding her, running away from her because he was in relationship with the Lord. So that movement into purity happens by justification. Justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the interior man. It's that transformation of our hearts. It's a real power at work in us to free us from the bonds of sin and lust. And we experience purity of heart to the measure that we experience the freedom for which Christ has set us free. Right. And so our purity of heart is related to and congruent with the freedom that we have. And, and that freedom that we have is always a freedom for, right? it's always a freedom to be in relationship. It's a freedom that allows us to choose the good. It's the freedom that makes us excited about going to spend time with our Lord in prayer. It's the freedom that like, gives us a desire to live our lives and um and to be curious about the ways that we might encounter our lord each and every day and and in all circumstances <clears throat> so when we talk about freedom again like like when we get caught up in the world freedom to sin the fact that we have freedom to commit sin is the flip side of freedom to love and the real reason God gave us freedom is so that we're free to love. So if we seek to get rid of sin by getting rid of our freedom to commit it, we also sacrifice our freedom to love. And so again, it goes back to what I was saying that, that like really we need to have boundaries and we need to like avoid occasions of sin and, and all of those things. But like really it's about like being free to love and be loved by the right people. Freedom is negated when it becomes a pretext for indulgence. It's not freedom, but slavery to our passions. And, and so there's a lot of times people like they want to act in their freedom, um, but then it becomes a pretext for indulgence. And, <clears throat> and then we end up again in slavery to our passions. So a lot of people would say like, they're free to do whatever they do, but they don't actually know if they're free until they try to stop like with any behavior or anything. Um, like when somebody's like, oh, I just choose to, like, I just like watching 18 hours of TV a day. Okay, so just, if you just do it because you'd like doing it, then you can stop. So just stop and see what happens. Because you might stop and realize like, whoa, I actually can't, like, this is agitating me. It's agitating my heart to stop. Um, like that's, it's kind of a, a test for, um, I don't know, when I was talking to some people about alcohol at one point in my life, um, and I was convinced I didn't have a problem, and uh, then somebody challenged me, and they said, well, just quit drinking then, if you don't have a problem, and then I was like, I don't want to quit drinking, like, what are you talking I started getting, like, agitated and mad at them, um, okay, so maybe I have more of an attachment than I thought I did, right, and it could be, like, Coca-Cola or, like, eating those Sam's Club cookies back there. Um, and the virtues are important because they teach us to control our bodies in holiness and honor. And so the four cardinal virtues, they're, they're guideposts that help us, you know, to live in true freedom. Temperance is, gives us the ability to turn away from temptation, right? 
fortitude, the ability to endure and persevere. Prudence is about making proper choices to avoid, you know, those occasions. And then justice is about giving another person their due, you know, and like religion is a virtue that falls under justice because we're giving God his due. And, um, but, but it's, that's a strange way of putting it because really like what we're doing when we give him his due is giving him our hearts and, and we're doing that in response to what he has done for us first. And if we really understand what he's done for us first, like I gladly give from my heart. So as we grow in that purity of heart that helps us to see God in this world, not just in the next, we have to be committed to a progressive education and self-control of the will, the feelings, the emotions. And this education must develop beginning with the most simple acts in which it is relatively easy to put the interior decision into practice. And, and so, so beginning with smaller things, we, we just grow more and more and more and more and more in relationship with the Lord. And that's really what we do during Lent when we give things up for Lent. We're supposed to be growing in this education of self-control, the feelings, emotions, and the will. And, and we learn that from a young age, like when we give up chocolate or when we give up candy bars or cookies or, or whatever it is that we do for Lent. And, um, but I always try to emphasize and when I'm teaching young people that when we, when we do those things, um, like we're supposed to be making space for the Lord. So every time I want to eat a cookie, I'm going to ask Jesus to be with me right now. And just ask him to meet my needs right now. Every time I want to eat chocolate, every time I want to watch television, whatever it is that we give up is the moment in which we need to remember to ask our Lord to be with us, to meet whatever needs that we have or whatever desires that we have. Otherwise all we're doing is sort of practicing being tough, you know, and, and that's not really what Lent, Lent's not about practicing being tough or practicing doing hard things. It's about, that progressive education and self-control. So I'm gonna do one more slide, I think, and then uh, we'll be good for today. So authentic purity, um, another line John Paul II has is the parts of the body we think are less honorable deserve greater honor. And, and so like the parts of our body that specifically reveal the fact that we're created male and female deserve greater honor and, and, and because they are actually like the parts of our body that God calls us to unite with and to procreate with and become co-creators with him with. And shame causes us to cover the parts of our body and those parts have greater honor because they reveal our call to image God in life-giving communion. And so purity can be seen as a moral, through the moral dimension as a virtue, but also in a charismatic dimension as a gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's also connected to piety. So the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and the body reflects the image of God or the communion of person. Unchastity violates the communion of Christians. I'd say it also is connected to piety in the sense that like when we live purity of heart in that I'm including like any ways in which we're open to the world instead of to God. And we start to separate ourselves from those things we actually experience this greater closeness to God. And, and so we, our prayer life starts to happen on a completely different level when that happens. When we get food under control or drinking under control or whatever else under control, we just find that we have more space for our Lord. And and that's a fruit that I've seen happen, like in my own life, I've seen it happen in other people's lives. A friend of mine who does a lot of spiritual direction is somebody who also lost like hundred pounds on a food program. And, um, and he's noticed a lot, like as people change their relationship with food, their prayer life just like, gets way better. And, um, and maybe that's just because that might be the most common way that people today <clears throat> kind of close themselves off from God and, and seek the world 
Any questions on anything we did tonight? Oh, Keely joined. Good. What's the Mary Healy book? It's called Men and Women Are from Eden. It's a really small, easy read. She's a professor at the seminary in Detroit. And uh, it's a book I used to use when I taught high school. There's a bunch of copies of it in the basement um, the downstairs in the hall because I think that the kids we used it once. And the experiment with the mother and the baby. The still face experiment? What's it called? The still face experiment? So you just edtronic. So you can look it up. Yeah, usually I show the video and I'll show the video next next time. In January, I'll keep you on the edge of your seat. It's pretty good. Questions, comments, complaints? I think an hour is good. So we'll pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all the gifts you've given us. And as we uh, center into these last days before celebrating Christmas, we ask you to continue to purify our hearts, to help us to live in that ethos of redemption. Help us to notice the ways that we've been forgetful of you or turned to the world. Give us the grace of remembering that you are the source and summit of everything, that you are the one who can meet every need and every desire of our hearts. We pray for the grace of receiving you with great joy as we celebrate your coming at Christmas. And through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, and all the saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all.